stopped in the last nine months. Okay, I think, um, I have to say this, Polly, but there were some very good short-term headlines grabbed off the back of the decision by ministers to cancel regional plans. I don't think those are sustainable positions. Uh, I think what is important is right now, actually, we sit on some 300,000 consented plots of land which aren't being built out. Right now, our immediate problem is demand uh, and not supply. There is a medium to long-term issue about supply. Um, and there was a knee-jerk reaction before we published the bill, before we set up our planning policy in response to the decision to cancel regional plans. So some plans were shelved. I don't think that was permanent. Well, very quickly, can I just say, because there's an important time to explain. A lot of local councils, my own local one, South Coastal, uh, which is a rather good local council, but it has the situation where if it wants to get rather uh, controversial plans through, you don't want to add to that the fact that the, the opponents of it can say, well, we don't know what the plans are going to be, we're not sure where we're going to be. So it's quite a good idea sometimes to say, well, we're not going to put this forward now, we're going to wait until the bill comes through so we can use the powers there to get what we want. And this is a, a particular case that happened locally, and I think quite likely. Right, but I, I just want to pick up on a rather, I thought, telling phrase that Richard used, and it, you know, when we're discussing localism, it's a rather important phrase, because you described, quote unquote, planning at its best. But surely one question is how often right now is planning at its best? You know, in other sessions we've heard how planning so often just falls into a straightforward confrontational battle between proposers and opposers. And it really, it, it, it's not a system where planning at its best with this negotiating process that you talk about is actually in evidence. And I, I mean, Jeff, you know, you work on this sort of issue, trying to make um, communities work. Uh, this idea of planning at its best, is there any reason to believe that planning is going to be at its best when these issues are at stake? Well, our, our planning system is, and always has been, and long has been designed to be fairly confrontational, fairly quickly go to the courts and inquiries and so on. Other parts of Europe have always had negotiated approaches. It's just in, built both into law and into culture. But, but, but surely the point now is the government wants more empowerment for local communities wants the, the, the planning decisions you know to be very local but it isn't actually changing the system it isn't you know in somehow creating a more negotiated UK culture is it um, and it's quite hard to create a culture overnight but can I just pick up on one of the I mean both John and Richard acknowledge that in fact you can go as a long way perhaps with encouragement quite a long way with incentives but in fact you're talking about central power at some point imposing numbers on localities even if they don't want it mm. And almost no one, interestingly, is making the case for true localism, where every community can decide for itself. Equally, I think no one here makes the case that the free market works very well in housing. If anyone's in any doubt on that, go over to Ireland, 300,000 empty homes there. Or Dubai, half of all office space empty. I mean, markets are very strange things when it comes to property and housing. They're not particularly efficient, they're not particularly rational. And I think the real challenge alongside all of this is how do you get the various parts of the market to function more intelligently, more sustainably. I would like to see a move to business models which were much longer term, where actually the investors in new builds stuck with developments for 10 or 20 years, not three or four years. And lots of our problems, I think, flow from a fundamentally flawed underlying business model, which then drives much of the planning uh, process uh, around and, it. And how do you achieve that longer term? approach. Well, this is where governments could be setting both rules and incentives and all sorts of other things. I mean, governments have many tools for shaping markets. Uh, some work well, some work quite badly sometimes. But I, I say this, this is a market where I think everyone here acknowledges if we are having a population rise of 8, 10 million and other factors, smaller family size and so on, we need <coughs> bound to need even more housing proportionately. We can't simply hope that sort of underlying market or other forces will get us the desired result. Otherwise, we're almost bound to bequeath a pretty unpleasant legacy to, our, to the next generation. Mm. Polly, John was very much sort of dismissing many of your opening arguments. Do you feel like making a riposte at this point? Well, I don't know. Perhaps we should be throwing it well, over. Well, we will in a moment. Um, but I, you know, I think that there is this essential tension between uh, what kind of localism you really mean. And I know that John has very good uh, instincts about things to do with climate change, about things to do with, with localism. And, and, and a lot of people can see ways in which uh, a lot of decisions could be made much better locally. But I just wanted to sign 
the big problems, the big democratic deficits that you can build if you're not careful, the handing over to the wrong people if you're not careful, uh, the decision making that gets taken by the wrong people in the wrong place in the name of a form of democracy that turns out to be empty. If you can't get people to turn up to meetings, you know, and, 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 and two, me two old men and a dog turn up and the decision's made there, that is much worse than it being made at a higher level where at least there is democratic accountability. So you've got to be quite sure you get the sort of community engagement that's genuine of the kind that Jeff has worked with. Um, before you can do it, and there's a danger that by mandating at the top that everything is going to happen locally, in a lot of virtually empty communities, um, the decision won't really be made where it's supposed to be made by the people. You've just got to be sure that you've got an active enough community that is authentic enough to take those sorts of decisions. And, and, and Polly mentions climate change, and I know you know you've spent a lot of time thinking about that, and you care about it. And obviously, in the climate change terms the national government has laid out a strategic direction and it, 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 it is laid out mandatory emissions cuts which we as a nation will have to meet. Uh, no no <laughs> localism is going to get away from it. These are national strategic signposts. And isn't housing uh, a similar sort of conundrum and challenge for us in that we do need national strategic signposts and actually beyond signposts, targets? Well, there are to be um, uh, targets in the sense of figures, as, as well, no one's disagreeing that the people won't be able not to build any. The question is, how do you get the balance between people having a say about where they will be, what kind of housing it will be, how it will be mixed, what sort of arrangements will we make, and what infrastructure shall be there? I mean, I come from a county which was told that it was going to have yet more houses almost every year, but no money at all for infrastructure. When we're talking about unfairness, you really want to look at the places where the, the local authorities have least money. They aren't in Liverpool, as a matter of fact. They are in the Shire counties, where a penny rate, so to speak, raises practically no money, and where successive periods of time over the last 11 years have removed money from them to such a degree that they find it very difficult to do any of these things. So all sorts of things are happening there to try to find ways of making it work. So I, I think you mustn't have two north-south uh, big towns uh, rolling uh, suburbia uh, view of this. It's a very much more complex than that, and all I want to say is that no one is saying that we aren't going to have standards, although there is one question which is the unspoken question. We all assume that demand and need in housing are exactly the same. And one of the dangerous things is we have created an unsustainable family structure system. Now, I'm not going to give you an answer to this, but let's just ask ourselves. We now have a situation in which Many families expect to have two family homes because that is what having the children shared between the parents means. So if you look at the figures at the moment, something like, something like 50% of the new homes necessary come from social structural changes. And that is a very fundamental issue when you're dealing with climate change. It may be, it may be that we have to talk about the sustainability of the lifestyles which we have set up. Now, it's a very unpopular thing well, I to mention that, that, but it ought to be mentioned. I can't imagine you'd be an advocate of the government uh, mandating family units. Well, he was, because I interviewed him once when he was a minister, and he wanted to set up um, hostels for um, unmarried mothers right. and their children. So I, I fear we may be just about to be another. But I'm not going to get out of the concept. All I'm saying is, this. In all the issues of housing, one of the problems is there are many hidden assumptions which we have. And I just say we should be prepared at all circumstances to do a folly toy bit, which is never to have any hidden assumptions, right. but actually to admit that there are things here which are quite difficult to answer. And just so we, we understand the story about the, the, the national standards, if you go to a national standard that has no traction, it means nothing other than a political figure, until you then hardwire it into a set of top down um, targets. Uh, and then you just repeat the problem of the process we've just been through. So actually what you have to do, the mandating is not the number, but the requirement. Sure. The ministers have already said this, you'll see it in national planning policy, we're, we're rewriting the whole of national planning policy to make it shorter and sharper, and that will be published as the national planning policy framework in the next few months. But ministers have already said 
that they would expect local authorities to plan for the needs and demands that face their area. What, what if localism doesn't deliver, though? You know, what if in two or three years' time you find that, because you made the point that you know, uh, targets were missed in the past, but what if your hope that the, the new regime will actually deliver uh, a more efficient system and, and actually more, uh, more housing developments, what, what if you're wrong? At what point do you actually then say, you know what, localism and sort of hands-off central government isn't, isn't working? I mean, would you, two or three years down the track, see the need then to intervene? Well, I think the first thing you'd say to your minister at that point, this is when you do say, hang on a second, uh, because you may have noticed the things that you said, hang on a second, that we actually got on with in the last few months. But you actually say, before you leap to say that's the fault of localism not working, one of the big issues about housing is actually understand what it is that's gone wrong that's created yeah. a situation that you don't like. So is it about the credit system? Is it about other things in society that's changed things? Or has localism not worked? Is it an issue about getting the incentives in the wrong place? Because something doesn't work, you don't throw it all out. You ask yourself, what isn't working about it? And we don't do that enough with housing. We, we let housing be dictated across the piece, both uh, capital and lowercase p, for almost political judgments through the media and through our own conversations. We complain about housing being built, and then we complain our sons and daughters can't get a home. We complain about the costs of housing, and yet we don't understand the cost of houses related to constraining housing supply, and so on and so forth. All right, well, look, there's plenty of contentious issues up here, so let's see what sort of questions and comments we get from the floor. So do feel free to raise a hand. So you've got yours up early, so we'll get the microphone to you. Just give us your name and your question and or comment. Make it as pithy as you can. Uh, good afternoon. My good uh, I actually live in uh, John Gomer's constituency. I'm sure you'd be pleased to know that in the uh, predicted land use that we will need for the next 6 to 15 years, of house building, 70% of that is Greenfield, which feels a, a lot of us living there with despair in that we live alongside a community at Ipswich, which has enough brownfield land within it to be building houses on brownfield until 2040, 2050. Sorry, so are you saying that the, the greenfield uh, sites that have been outlined have permission yes. to build? Uh, well, we are at the point of adopting our core strategy and within that we are saying because of lack of brownfield in our community which actually has a huge amount of area of outstanding natural beauty so there is a shortage of land anyway mm. that uh, from 6 to 15 years time 70% of the land that will need to be allocated will be greenfield right. which is very worrying. But the question I wanted to ask the panel was Perhaps one of the problems with our planning system is that there is no right of appeal for the objectors. It's an on ballot system. There's a pre-agreement uh, uh, that the applicant, if it's agreed, will go forward, and there is no appeal against that. What I wanted to know is we have a lot of our population being not able to buy within our villages. Within the localism bill, will there be the ability for that community, if it wishes, to self-build outside of the village envelope to keep the viability of our small rural villages alive? Because currently they've already died in Cornwall and Devon, it's now coming into Suffolk and elsewhere, particularly with coastal communities. Because you're talking about the second home phenomenon. That is one impact, but the problem is that some communities, as was pointed out, don't wish any building in their village at all. In fact, they've been asked to have their envelopes removed in our current process of consultation. Right, well, there you go, uh, a voice from a rural community. Um, who wants to pick up on well, that? Well, can I just deal with the localism bill, certainly, because I can give you some uh, good news. Good. The localism bill contains the community rights to build that would allow the local community, if it's a parish, a local parish, to determine new homes to be built um, in their local area. Uh, and it's a very enabling and permissive power. We're also giving you the power to create a neighbourhood plan um, for your parish or the creation of, uh, of a parish type area through a community forum, resulting, by the way, not in six people, but everybody actually then voting on the plan in the referendum. So there actually is some real democracy built into it. Will so that be funded? So the localism bill, there will be support going to local government. Uh, uh, to recognise the additional burdens of supporting the production of neighbourhood plans. And we have already got a competition running at this moment in time to invite specialist bodies to work with communities and our trailblazers to start that process. So um, uh, the localism bill is going to allow people